that thunderclap could mean one of two things. Either a storm is a brewing, or it's time for another episode of How to Kill a Piano with your host, me, George Tate. Hey, first of all, thanks so much for coming back, for listening, for tuning in, for sharing this with your friends, your family, your loved one, your enemies, whoever you like to share things with. That means a lot to me, as always. Last week, if you missed last week's episode, or if you're just catching up now, you'll realize that we deviated from the story just a little bit. Don't worry, this time, this episode, we are back into story mode and away from playing weird music from my, my teenage years. This is a lot of fun. This has been a lot of fun for me so far. This is podcast number seven. And this particular podcast is different from other podcasts in that it is a continual story that picks up where it left off. It's kind of like those old serials from the, or, or, or movie serials or chapter plays in the motion picture houses of the 20th century, where you, they would play for a week long and they would always end in a cliffhanger, much like episodical television does today. I suppose we still have that, but the movie house has been replaced with our bedrooms, our kitchen tables, or the park, or wherever our mobile devices can take us. This is no different. While it might not exactly end on a cliffhanger every week, it certainly does hopefully end making you want more story. And without further ado, here comes more story. How to Kill a Piano, Chapter 6, Namesakes I never slept with stuffed animals as a child, but I had a fondness for one in particular, a stuffed koala bear. He was about a foot tall and held a eucalyptus leaf between its paws perched right below its mouth. We were driving around town when Uncle Charlie gifted the koala to me in celebration shortly after he adopted me. For the first few years we were all together, the koala had no name. It used to ride shotgun along Uncle Charlie in his manual powdered blue Ford Topaz. It was one of those cars from the future. It had the kind of seatbelts that would strap you in automatically. When you closed the door or turned the engine, the top of the seatbelt would travel along a track in the top of the door frame, ride over your shoulder, and bring the end of the seatbelt down to secure you in place. Before I came along to take over the passenger seat, the belt was constantly knocking the stuffed koala on the floor as it traveled back and forth when the car was turned on or off. I always imagined that the koala was playing a game of jump rope, but he was so clumsy and euphoric from consuming too many eucalyptus leaves that he'd submit to the inevitability that the seatbelt was going to get him anyway. The belt would send him tumbling to the depth of the floor mats below, where he'd simply roll over, and continued chewing on his next leaf of eucalyptus without a care in the world. Charlie wasn't picky about what his vehicles looked like. As long as they ran and weren't too banged up, Charlie had no issue driving them. In an ideal world, he longed for perfection around every corner. It wasn't so much that he was obsessed with perfectionism, but more that it gave space for the imperfections that were always unavoidable. It might have been an imperfection that Charlie never named the koala, or it might have been perfection. Once I eventually came into Charlie's life, his indecision gave me the opportunity and privilege to decide on the perfect name. The first time I asked what Charlie's koala bear's name was, he quipped, Oh, <laughs> you mean my karwala? He snorted, holding back a giggle. Do you like him, sport? He's been my co-pilot with all the right qualifications for years. I stared at Uncle Charlie blankly. I hadn't yet grasped the concept of a pun. Once I grew to understand punny concepts, I still found puns lame. Charlie usually assured me that the inherent fluidity of language is a entrepreneur's delight. As I grow older, I must admit... Puns don't really have the clever qualities that Charlie placed on a pedestal of humor. I snapped out of my blank stare and queried Charlie again. 
You mean to tell me you've never given this cute little guy a name? George, how do you know that it's a he? Did you ask what pronouns they'd prefer and like you to use? Come on, Charlie. It's just a stuffed toy. Where'd you get him? That toy, as you call it, is quite the world traveler. In fact, before it started traveling with me, it had already seen much of the world without me. My Karwala's first journey was traveling from Perth, Australia, all the way across a body of water that was too small to be considered a pond and yet too large to be considered a lake. It then traveled across country by semi-truck. It navigated along the great cement rivers until it found its way to my doorstep, much like I found you. Uncle Charlie always had a fetish for dramatizing normal, everyday life. That's certainly something I've picked up from Uncle Charlie over the years. Did the storks bring the koala as a gift too, I asked? No, not exactly. Charlie looked down nervously for a moment, allowing his eyes to wander off the road ahead of us. It wasn't enough to put us in danger as the car barreled down the back roads, but long enough that I could feel Charlie getting stuck in his head again. He called these moments feedback loops. He didn't often go into specifics with me, but I know they usually had to do with a cup of chamomile tea and someone he very much loved and lost. Charlie would lecture, There can be good feedback loops and negative feedback loops. The positive loops are the ones that we should both focus on. Those help us be productive. They help us think from other people's perspectives and let us problem-solve the tough questions. I know that Charlie's feedback loops were in some gray areas in between the two. After all, nothing is ever black and white. I flipped the koala bear in my hands a few times. It was soft, but rough on my fingers. A small white cloth tag caught my attention, jetting out from the seam at the back. Charlie, the tag says it came from China, not Australia. Like I told you before, world traveler. That's why the car Walla always rides with me. I imagine it's so we can see the world together. Now that I have you, they have both of us to courier the world with. Charlie winked. Hey, do you want to give the koala a name? I looked over the stuffed creature carefully. I knew that christening wasn't something Charlie did flippantly. He sometimes took weeks to ponder the perfect prenomen. Charlie once rescued a goldfish from the pet section at the local market, where he discovered that the other fish had been eating away at its flesh, leaving large red scabs on its scales. Charlie didn't believe in keeping fish in captivity, and that, like most animals, they were best suited to a life without a cage. He also didn't believe in leaving an animal to suffer, if he could help it. He named the fish, ironically, Mr. Soprophagus because, like the meaning of its namesake, he assumed that the fish would become dead animal flesh sooner rather than later. Charlie's plan was to give Mr. Soprophagus the most peaceful rest of their life that could be had. Maybe it was the power in the name Mr. Soprophagus that kept the goldfish alive, or perhaps it was the love that Uncle Charlie showed Mr. Soprophagus that helped spring good health back into the scales and away from Sharon's deathly boat ride. The truth is, that fish has now been alive and in Charlie's care for over 15 years. Mr. Soprophagus now lives in the water near Charlie's house that's too large to be considered a pond, yet too small to be named a lake. We still visit from time to time. I'm not saying Charlie's naming conventions are perfect, but I'll always respect the level of care that goes into Charlie's decisions. By the way, Mr. Soprophagus is currently pregnant and expecting babies of her own. Names hold power. Not only power within the names, but they allow us to discover power within ourselves. When we embrace our name, whether it's our given name or one we've helped birth, we're embracing life. Naming Charlie's koala was my opportunity to embrace part of life for the first time. I reflected on all the knowledge I had learned so far about koalas. I thought about that with the exception of this one koala that I got to name, koala bears only lived naturally in one place in the entire world. I then pondered how koalas were marsupials and that their paw prints were virtually indistinguishable from human fingerprints. 
I thought it might be cute to name the car Walla after another kind of marsupial, calling him Wallaby, because it almost sounded to me like the human name Wally. To this day, I still love the fact that while koalas might look cute and cuddly, they're actually quite vicious. They always remind me to never judge anything or anyone by looks alone. They only eat eucalyptus leaves, and they drink very little water. In fact, they eat so many leaves that they smell like a eucalyptus tree. I flicked the tip of the vinyl eucalyptus leaf back and forth as Charlie pulled the car up into the driveway of our house. Well, sport, what have you decided? There's no need to rush into a name. You might think of one today, a week from now, or a month in the future. Take your time. You'll know the right choice when it comes. Mm. I was thinking I'd call her Eucalyptus, I proudly stated. Well, I think that means Eucalyptus is now under your protection. I'd like you to keep her and take good care of her for me. Promise me you'll show her the world. From that point on, Eucalyptus sat on the nightstand. I watched out for her, and in return, she kept an eye on me. The wall monsters of my bedroom protected the walls, but it was Eucalyptus that protected the bed. The next morning, after Charlie scooped me up from the basement floor, I woke to the smell of banana pecan pancakes. I opened my eyes to the sun smiling in my face and the sound of a dog's muffled bark in the distance. Time to get up, squirt! I heard Charlie's call from the other room. I pulled the covers over my face. I was never a morning person. Charlie opened the door to my room while knocking. This was a move he always practiced, never waiting for my answer before entering. How's your head, Squirt? Let me sleep for another hour, please. W wait a minute, my, my head? You knocked yourself out pretty hard last night, kid. I, oh, I remember. You were playing the piano last night, Charlie. That's enough fanaticism, kiddo. Are you going to come eat some of these pancakes, or are you going to make me eat them all by myself? A and the night before, you were playing... You're playing the guitar, Charlie. Charlie didn't play the piano, and Charlie almost certainly didn't play guitar. When he sang George to sleep, it was always slightly out of tune and a cappella, with the occasional kazoo for levity. George, you know I'm complete rubbish and wouldn't know my way around an instrument if it fell into my lap. But, but Charlie, I, I heard you. Don't you remember? You played me the alphabet song on the guitar. Don't you remember last night? You made that piano sing. You were so great. I think what makes most people great at things is that they secretly know that they'll suck, Charlie began to lecture. It's the suck that motivates them to do their best. I try to never stop learning, but I don't yet have the knack for music. I do think we should learn together soon, especially now that we have a piano beneath our feet all the time. Will you really teach me? I asked. We made our way down the hallway to the kitchen table. That's as dangerous as asking someone to teach you to have opinions, Charlie winked. Absolutely. I'll do my best. It would be my honor. Charlie piled a stack of pancakes in front of me that was almost as tall as my head. He always made them with maple syrup baked into each hot cake so that they were never at risk of being endangered with oversaturation. Charlie's pancakes were the perfect amount of moisture and fluff, and they melted in my mouth with every forkful. The hot kettle started to whistle as it came to a boil. Charlie grabbed two mugs off the hooks on the wall and poured us both a cup of English breakfast tea. Can we start playing today? I eagerly encouraged. I don't think so, Squirt. Today's an adventure day, Charlie smiled while pouring the rest of the hot water into a pot on the stove. There's no time to be mucking about in the basement. We have a big day ahead of us. Finish your pancakes, pack a day bag, and change into something suitable for the island. What are we going to do on the island today, Uncle Charlie? 
It's time we pass our congratulations on to Mr. Saprophagus. Charlie had started a bowl of oats cooking on the back burner. Oatmeal? I don't know if I have any more room after I finish the stack of your awesome pancakes. Oh, the oatmeal isn't for us. It's a gift for when we visit Mr. Saprophagus and the fry. In some strange, twisted linguistic Mobius striptease, the proper terminology for a baby goldfish is fry. This always bothered Uncle Charlie. While he often loved the perfect name to attach itself to a subject, he also loathed the idea of frying any sentient living creature. Humans can be delusional and heedless monsters. During the first week of a goldfish's life, a diet of dry oats can make the most perfect, delectable treat. Uncle Charlie had always been curious if cooked oats would be favored any differently than raw oats. Today, he had planned to have his answer before the sun set. I cleaned the dishes while Charlie packed up the treats. I packed a day bag that included a frisbee, a change of clothes, and my favorite two-stringed kite. We climbed into Charlie's topaz and shut the doors. The seatbelts slid into place. Charlie backed out of the driveway and drove away from our house, starting the day's adventure, leaving the piano behind and alone in the house without us. Mr. Screwtape slowly stroked his well-groomed goatee to a point as he reclined in the passenger seat of the moving van that was parked three places down the street from the Lenore house. This is going to be a tad bit trickier than we had originally projected, isn't it, Mr. Wormwood? It shall indeed, Mr. Screwtape. The young one seems... stubborn. A small monitor shot into the dashboard of the vehicle as they both reclined further as Mr. Wormwood continued. We shall descend to the bureaucracy, consult the fantastic Felanius administrator, and return with a solid plan. Aye, what a fantastic ordeal, Mr. Wormwood. Both gentlemen seemed to sink into their seat cushions until only the tips of each of their noses were visible. And then, in less than a moment... They were gone. All of the music in today's podcast was written and performed by myself, George Tate. The story was, of course, also written by me, and you can read more about us at howtokillapiano.com. We'll be back again next Monday with another episode. Until then, it's been swell, but the swelling's gone down. I'll see you next time.